Good evening to everyone. I would like to welcome you all to INSA's first leadership dinner of 2017. And what a dinner this is. I think we're breaking some records here tonight. INSA is very pleased and honored to host FBI Director Jim Comey. And Jim, I would like to thank you and your staff for your support of INSA and for you being here this evening. I must say, with all of the demands on Director Comey's time, I wasn't sure this night was going to happen. So I just flew in from Boston, and when I flew in and saw his security detail in the parking lot, I kind of went, yes, it's, it, it's still on track. So, um, and, and I know I speak for everyone, especially the row of press back there, when I say that, Jim, we look forward to your remarks um, after dinner this evening. Of course, everyone knows that the FBI is the world's preeminent law enforcement agency. And as folks in this room are well aware, the FBI is also essential to our national intelligence efforts, working to protect Americans in the homeland and abroad. And we look forward to hearing about the FBI's interaction and engagement with all of our IC partners particularly how the Bureau is helping law enforcement and intelligence evolve to meet new homeland threats. The FBI is a valued member and partner of the intelligence community, thanks in part to the outstanding leadership of Director Comey and his predecessor, Director Bob Mueller, whom I should mention, INSA is pleased to be recognizing with the William Oliver Baker Award in June. Reflecting the FBI's more established footprint in the IC, this is, the INSA's, um, this is INSA's first leadership dinner with an FBI director. And Director Comey, I hope there are many more to come. I think you have a, just a few more years in your job, so hopefully we'll get you back here. Yes, six, but who's counting? So following Director Comey's remarks, we will transition into a Q&A session moderated by former NCTC Director, that's National Counterterrorism Center Director, Mike Leiter. And Mike, thank you so much for being here as well. I, I won't say better late than never. We're just glad you made it in time for dinner. Um, we hope you enjoy the evening and we look forward to the upcoming discussion. Now I'm sure there are going to be plenty of questions from the audience. If you look in the center of your table, there are cards and pens at each table. Please jot down your question, and towards the end of dinner, there will be um, staff from INSA who will come by to pick up the cards. And we are just going to jump right into dinner to give everyone a chance to enjoy that and to give the director and Mike uh, enough time for a wide-ranging discussion. Again, thank you all for being here, and enjoy your meal. So it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Roger Mason. I think most of you know Roger. I'm not going to do a long introduction, Roger, OK? But the uh, Roger Senior Vice President at Noblis uh, and a member of INSA's Board of Directors. Uh, he's also an assistant former director of national intelligence uh, for systems resource and analysis. Uh, and he's been around the defense and intelligence communities for a very long time doing extraordinarily important work. Uh, that has benefited us all, and he's also a wonderful friend. So, Roger, over to you to introduce Director Comey. Uh, Director Comey is a graduate of the College of William and Mary and the University of Chicago School of Law. He's a Yonkers native, and as we learned last week, he's also an avid New York Giants fan. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Director James Comey a warm intelligence community welcome here for INSA. Thanks so much. Good to see thank you. For the, thank you for that kind introduction. I did take a shot at the New England Patriots on live television, which I heard about from one of my brothers who betrayed the family when he moved to Massachusetts and became a Patriots fan. Uh, 
Uh, what I want to do very briefly is share with you some thoughts that are top of mind today for the FBI. And then I want to shut up and take questions that I will try to avoid answering from the great Mike Leiter. Um, uh, and I'm determined not to make news, for those of you who are following this. Um, first, things that are top of mind. I want to talk very, very briefly about how the FBI is thinking about our cyber strategy. You hear me OK? Yeah. How the FBI is thinking about our cyber strategy. Then I want to talk about a unique challenge to all of our work in the form of ubiquitous strong encryption and explain to you why that matters so much to the FBI and why we are determined to continue to talk about it. But first, our cyber strategy. To state the obvious for this room, all the threats the FBI is responsible for come at us through the internet. Counterintelligence, all the criminal threats we're responsible for, and terrorists in the following way. To proselytize, to communicate, to inspire, to direct, not yet to use the cyber vector as a way of doing actual harm, inflicting harm on infrastructure, but logic tells us that's inevitable for the terrorist mind to find that vector. And so all the threats the FBI is responsible for come at us in that way. The first part of our strategy is humility. We are standing in the middle of the greatest transformation, I think, in human history. The way we learn, the way we work, the way we love, the way we connect, the way we believe, all is affected by the digital era, the digital rev revolution. And so we stand there with an attitude of humility because it would be foolish to say, we know how the FBI should grow and change and adapt to meet a transformation that has never happened in human history. We don't know for sure. What we're trying to do are things that are thoughtful, that make good sense to us, and then get feedback from our own people, from our partners, from our colleagues around the world about whether it's making sense, and then we will iterate. But our strategy has five parts, and actually two parts of it I want to spend some time on. So I'll run through it relatively quickly. Our first part of our strategy is we want to focus ourselves. And there are two aspects that I want to highlight for you of the way in which we're trying to focus. The first is the way we assign the work in the FBI. Traditionally in the FBI, the physical manifestation of an event is what drives who works on it. So if the bank robbery happens in Chicago, the Chicago field office works the bank robbery. If the fraud is based in Seattle, the Seattle office. We've come to the conclusion that the physical manifestation of a cyber intrusion especially isn't all that meaningful because it's being committed likely by somebody far away from the physical manifestation. It's being committed at the speed of light and it may be quite random as to where the intrusion pops first. And so we're approaching our work in a very different way for the FBI. We now assign computer intrusion work, whether that's a nation state, whether it involves a criminal syndicate, whether it involves a criminal syndicate working for a nation state, whether it involves hacktivists or somebody else, sort of the motley crew of people who are engaged in intrusions, we assign it based on talent. We make a judgment as to which field office has shown the best chops against a particular dimension of the threat posed to us by a nation state, and we assign it there because they've demonstrated the ability. But because physical manifestations of intrusions are part of the real world, and there really is a chief information security officer, and there really is a CSO and a CEO of a company that's been victimized, we're not blind to physical manifestation. And so we assign the threat to the talent, and then we allow up to four other offices to help. The first office is called a strat office for strategic. The other offices are called TAC offices for tactical. And then we air traffic control from Washington. This has had a great effect inside the FBI because it has fostered an intense competition among field offices to, ge to demonstrate, generate and demonstrate the talent against various dimensions of the threat. And so if Little Rock shows us they are best against a particular intrusion set from a foreign nation, it goes to Little Rock regardless of where the hits are from that intrusion set. So far, it's working pretty well. So far, the air traffic control has worked well. But again, we stand here with humility. And if it isn't working in some way, we're going to iterate. That's the way we're now assigning the work. The second way we're trying to focus ourselves is on stealing your talent. 
And here's what I mean by that. The challenge we face at the FBI is that to have a special agent working cyber, we need a variety of things. We need high integrity. We need fitness. We're going to give you a firearm on behalf of the FBI. You have to be able to run, fight, and shoot. So we need integrity, fitness. Then we need smarts. We need intelligence. And then we need specialized knowledge to make you a cyber agent. That collection of attributes is rare in nature. We may find integrity, somebody who can't do a push-up, who has great specialized knowledge and general intelligence, or we'll find somebody who's great specialized knowledge, can pump out a push-up, and wants to smoke weed on the way to the interview. <laughs> yeah. And so we stare at the pool of talent, and we have two reactions to the pool. We can't compete on money. You in the private sector have more money than we. We acknowledge that to the people we're trying to recruit. But then we also make sure they understand life with you is soulless and empty. <laughs> he said half kiddingly. Um, and if you want to do work with moral content, come to us. It's not about the living, it's about the life. A pitch that I know worked for a lot of you in this, in this uh, room of ours. And so we try and recruit on moral content. And then we're trying to think differently about how might we generate that talent in a number of different ways. We're considering, do we really need gun-carrying special agents making up an entire squad? Now we have squads of eight around the country. Should we instead have two special agents and six something else's? Maybe people of integrity, people of high intelligence, people of specialized knowledge. We don't give them a gun because they don't have that physical attribute, maybe. Something else we're considering is, if we can find that integrity, that physicality, and basic high intelligence, should we grow our own? Should we build our own university to take that talent and raise it up to be cyber talent? Maybe. And should we also do something else that'd be very, very new for the FBI? Should we try to make the barrier between us and the private sector semi-permeable? So that special agents might come and work for the FBI and then go work in the private sector and then come back. The current rule requires anyone who leaves for 24 months to go back through Quantico. And that's a painful experience for people in their 40s. They all want to come back because they discover your lives are empty and soulless. Um, <laughs> and so they want to come back, but we've made real barriers to their returning. And might we be able to encourage people from the private sector to come work with us as that something else? Don't have to go through Quantico to learn to run, fight, and shoot? and then return to the private sector. Our minds are open to all of these things because we are seeking a talent, talent in a pool that is increasingly small. And so you're gonna see us experiment with a number of different approaches to this, and then I hope when you see us doing something that doesn't make sense, you'll tell us, or you see us doing something you think we ought to do more of, you'll tell us that as well. And it will be met with an attitude of humility. So focusing in a better way our work and on how to get our best talent is the first part of our strategy. The second part is we need to make sure that we, inside the government, have our act together in such a way that it doesn't matter to whom a victim of an intrusion or, or a cryptoware attack or some other attack, it doesn't matter who they tell in the federal government. We're in that place when it comes to counterterrorism. You walk up to an FBI agent, a deputy sheriff, a police officer, with a piece of information about it, counterterrorism, about terrorism threat, it will get to the right place very, very quickly. It doesn't matter who you tell. We've got to get to that place inside the federal government. We made a lot of progress on that, trying to understand the rules of the road, but we still have work to do. The third thing we're trying to do is impose costs. I don't know of a cyber intrusion that has ever been committed high on crack or inflamed by finding a lover in the arms of another. These are crimes, these are intrusions, these are attacks that are committed with reflection and calmness at a keyboard. We think that's an opportunity for deterrence, for influencing behavior. And so we are keen to make sure that that attacker, whether it's somebody sitting in a government office halfway around the world or in a basement somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, that they feel our breath on the back of their necks, maybe literally, but at least metaphorically, as they begin that intrusion activity. We think we can shape behavior 
by locking people up, and where we can't lock people up, by sending messages of pretty scary deterrence, faces on wanted posters. And people sometimes say to me, yeah, but the, the hacker is somewhere halfway around the world working for another government, or they're sheltered by a government. How are you ever going to get them? And my response is, life is long. The world is short. We are dogged people. We just gave up on D.B. Cooper, and that took us about 52 years, I think. For those of you who are young, he was a guy who jumped out of an airplane over the Pacific Cascades, and we hunted him for 50 years. We're pretty sure he's dead now, so we're giving up. But when your face goes on a wanted poster, we are not going to give up in your lifetime. And that can change behavior. So you will see us trying to send those messages to shape people as they think about intrusions. The fourth aspect of our strategy I won't spend a lot of time on is to help our brothers and sisters in state and local law enforcement raise their digital game because everything they do requires digital literacy. In the good old days, a narcotics detective would roll up on a location, execute a search warrant at a drug house and find not just drugs and money, but one of those black composition notebooks. And the dealers would have written who got how much and how much they were. And that had to be photocopied, an exhibit sticker put on it, and you were good to go. Today, there's no black composition notebook. There's a PDA, there's a thumb drive, there's a laptop, there is a digital device. We have to help our colleagues get to that work in a quality way, because there's simply no way the FBI can be part of helping with all of it. I'm told that people get emails from me when I'm in Nigeria asking for money to be wired. <laughs> um, I usually write, identify myself as the president of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, don't send me any money, but people do get ripped off, and the Bureau can't reach all of that. So the fourth part of our strategy is help our partners raise their game, and there's a lot be behind that, but I'll leave it there. The fifth thing, which is the one I want to spend just a few minutes on, we must get better at sharing information across the boundary, and there should be a boundary, between the public sector and the private sector. We have to find ways consistent with law and policy and tradition and culture to make the barrier between us and the private sector semi-permeable in some fashion. And the reason for this is nearly all of the intrusion activity in the United States coming at the United States hits the private sector. All the victims are in the private sector, all the indicators are in the private sector, all the evidence, if we want to go criminal, is in the private sector. We are not nearly good enough at getting information from the private sector to us and getting information from us to the private sector. This, I believe, is actually a problem not so much of law, but of lore. And the biggest problem, I was a general counsel, as you heard, the biggest problem is people like I was, who are spotting risks and calling them out. Well, if we give that information to the government, will it be used against us in a competition? Will it be disclosed to Congress in some way that it becomes public? Will we get sued? What will our shareholders say? How will this hurt the enterprise? I see too many risks. What you ought to do is hire one of the great firms that can help us remediate, and let's get back on with our business. Even people saying, yes, our files are locked up with ransomware. Let's just pay the ransom and get on with it. Most of the intrusions in this country are not reported to law enforcement. And that is a very bad place to be. People are foolish and short-sighted to think that their interests in the private sector are not aligned with ours when it comes to this. Because you're kidding yourself if you don't realize that the, the hackers will be back. If not to you, then to your subsidiaries and your supply chain. Those with the